In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Pray with me. Our merciful and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our God, that you are our creator, that you are the giver of all blessings that we have, and we thank you for them. We thank you that you have allowed us to live another day, that we can be servants in your kingdom, that we can be a guiding light to this world. Holy Father, we thank you that you've given us this time that we can gather here this morning the opportunities to study more about your word. We thank you for Brother Melvin, for the lessons that he's delivered so far and for the ones that he'll uh, de deliver yet this morning. We thank you for his ability and uh, his long service, and we pray that you would continue to bless him, that his uh, service for you, for you may be uh, long and um, he may influence many others uh, for your cause. Holy Father, we're mindful that a number of our uh, number of our brethren have various uh, physical maladies, and we pray that you would uh, rain your blessings down upon them and restore them to a reasonable portion of their help if it's in keeping with your will. Father, we pray that, that you would uh, be with us as Brother Melvin has indicated, and that we would each let our light so shine that others would see Christ in us and desire to come to you. Father, bless us as we continue in this service today and as we go out into the world. May everything be done for your glory through Christ, we pray. Amen. If you will, please mark in your songbooks as the song of invitation number 911, number 911. Bring Christ your broken life. That will serve as our song of invitation at the appropriate time. Then, if you will, turn to number 162. Number 162, all hail the power of Jesus' name. We'll sing all four stanzas of this, and if you're uh, able to do so, and if it's convenient for you, please stand as we sing. <clears throat> all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him. Lord of all, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To Majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him Lord. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord of all. Please be seated.
Good morning. We've been thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the various things that he is to us, the various ways that he's significant to us in our lives. And I want us to think about something a little different than we've talked about thus far. I say to you, all of us at some time or another have trouble in our various relationships. Sometimes we will come to a place in a relationship where there has been some difficulty, some offense, that we have trouble overcoming ourselves. And so try as we might to reconcile, we're unable to do so on our own power, as it were. And so all of us know that at some point in time, in any relationship of significance, we will have to ask someone for some help. Now, the help that we ask for could be in the manner of advice. You simply go to someone and you say, listen, I'm, I'm having a trouble with my child. I'm trying to communicate something and the child doesn't seem to get it. Uh, have you ever seen anything like this? What did you do? And that's asking for help, right? Sometimes we have trouble in our marriage relationships. And so maybe a younger couple sort of spend some time with an older couple so they can get some guidance as to how to work through things. Listen, whatever trouble we might have in a relationship, we're not the first person to have trouble in a relationship. Sometimes we have trouble even in the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ sincerely love God, sincerely love one another, but sometimes they kind of come to an impasse and they need someone else to sit down with them and help them and sort of wake their way through whatever the trouble might be. Can I tell you that in society at large, this kind of thing happens all the time. Neighbors have trouble with one another. Coworkers have trouble with one another. People have accidents of various kinds and they need help sometimes in figuring out how to make their way through the trouble. When we come to an impasse like that, where we can't resolve the issue ourselves, when we ask for help, what we're really asking for is a mediator. A mediator is a middle person, a referee. In the old version, the King James Version, the mediator is called a daysman. In some newer translations, you'll see the word an umpire. Somebody whose job it is to call balls and strikes. Someone whose job it is to say what's fair and what's foul. Now we're going to have some engagement between two parties and there have to be rules as to how that engagement is going to unfold and somebody has to be there to make sure that both sides are respecting the rules, respecting the boundaries, so the contest, if it's a contest, or the relationship can move forward and function the way it's supposed to, a mediator. I say to you, mediators are sometimes necessary in essentially neutral circumstances. Sometimes you'll see this in your Bible, you'll see it in your life, but you'll see this in your Bible. Sometimes parties will use mediators because there's a difficulty communicating because of distance. So, for example, in 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 21, you see a reference there to Hezekiah and the king of Babylon conversing with one another through emissaries, through mediators. They're too far apart to talk to each other face to face, so they choose a middle person and they give messages to the middle person who goes back and forth between the two parties to facilitate communication. You know, parents sometimes do that. I'll say to one of my boys, tell your mom I don't feel like going. I don't want to say that myself. <laughs> tell your mom I don't feel like going, and then they'll come back and say, mom says we're going anyway. We didn't, we didn't talk directly, but we communicated effectively using a mediator. Sometimes you do that because of distance. You know, sometimes you use a mediator because there's some difficulty with language. Two parties have something in common, or at least they want to have something in common. They want to communicate with one another, but they're speaking different languages. Husbands and wives may be speaking English, and they still may be speaking two different languages. And sometimes they need someone in the middle to help facilitate communication. You know, you see this in Genesis chapter 42. You remember that Joseph is talking with his brothers, but he's in Egypt. He's a ruler in Egypt. They don't know who he is. He's not speaking to them in the Hebrew tongue. He's speaking the Egyptian language. They're speaking Hebrew, and they're using a translator, a mediator, to facilitate communication. 
What I'm saying to you is we all use mediators every day. We all know and understand that sometimes there's some difficulty and it can be essentially neutral. We're just too far apart or we don't speak the same language and we need someone to stand in the middle to help us communicate more effectively. Sometimes we use mediators when it's not really a neutral circumstance. Sometimes we need mediators because there is a hostility between two parties. Now, I say to you, we know that. We understand that. We use mediators all the time. Can I tell you that God has also dealt with the human family using mediators essentially from the beginning of time? And sometimes he uses mediators in what is essentially a neutral circumstance. God is separated from us. There is some distance between he and I. You remember that in the book of Exodus chapter 19, turn to Exodus chapter 19. You remember in the book of Exodus in chapter 19 as God is dealing with his people, he's giving them his law, but he's not really dealing with them directly. He's dealing with them through a mediator. Anybody ever heard of a man named Moses? Now, I don't know that I want to read all of this. I just want to show you what's happening here. In Exodus chapter 19, the Bible says, beginning about verse number 2, they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, verse 3, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Egypt. Now, what's going on? Moses is there with the people. God calls him apart from the people and then gives him a message for the people. So Moses is an intermediary. He's a mediator between God and the people. God gives him messages to give to the people, and then the people respond, and, God, and Moses takes that response back to God. Now, you can see that in Exodus chapter 19. Look at chapter 20. This becomes really explicit here in chapter 20. Look at verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has, not, has come to test you, that the fear of him may be... So I got to turn the page here. The fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood afar off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. What's happening here? You see, God is separated from the human family, not just by distance, but his divinity sets him apart. His holiness sets him apart from the human family. And so he's communicating with the human family through an intermediary, this man Moses. He also used other kinds of mediators. Look at Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, verse number 19, the Bible tells us that God used other kinds of mediaries in dealing with Israel. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Listen to it. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Listen, an intermediary is necessary, a mediator is necessary to stand between two parties. And God used his angelic messengers at times to communicate with the human family, and he used human beings at times to carry messages back and forth between him and the human family. He did this in essentially neutral circumstances, just because of the distance between him and human beings, because he's in heaven and we're here on earth. He's divine and thrice holy, and we are imperfect mortal beings. He used intermediaries. You know, but sometimes God used intermediaries because there was hostility between him and the human family, because there was a dispute between him and the human family, because there was a controversy between him and the human family. You know, when husbands and wives have to talk with one another, it's easier to do when there's not an ongoing pressing dispute between them. You know, when there's some live controversy in the household, that's when people most oftentimes need help. Well, God has a live controversy with the human family. It's called sin. 
The Bible says in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that listen, God's arm is not short that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear, but your sin, your iniquity is separated between you and your God so that he will not hear. Sin is the problem. Sin is the controversy. Sin causes a breach in the relationship between God and the human family. You remember in 1 Peter 3 and verse number 7, God says that of a husband, a husband needs to make sure he treats his wife the right way so that his prayers to God would not be hindered. Listen, a person who's mistreating his fellow human being and what human being has never mistreated a fellow human being? Another person made in the image of God that hinders their relationship with God. That's a sin. Listen, God has a live controversy with the human family. It's called sin. And that makes it more difficult for God to sit down and, and converse with a human being face to face. It's not going to work because there's a problem. There's a breach there. And so this is why we need help. And you know what God does? He sends intermediaries. He sends mediators. He's always done that. For example, he sends prophets. Prophets generally speak on God's behalf. Sometimes people think of prophets as people who tell the future. And you know what? In the Old Testament, there was sometimes a predictive element to the prophetic work. But a prophet is a person who speaks on God's behalf. So God would give a message to a person, and then that person would go and communicate that message to the human family on God's behalf. The prophet was a mediator. Listen to it. God would tell the prophet what he wanted, to, what wanted the people to hear, and that person would be responsible for communicating that. Now you remember in 2 Samuel chapters 12, uh, David has sinned with Bathsheba there in the previous chapter and God wants to deal with that. And how does he deal with that? He dispatches a man named Nathan and Nathan goes to Dan David and tells him the problem. David sees the problem, doesn't see that it's himself. And then Nathan says, you are the man. Listen, God is going to deal with your sin. How does that information come to David? It comes through a mediator. I know a lot of people today who say, you know what, if God would just tell me, and what they mean is if he would just tell me directly what he wants me to know, then I would do it. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You won't do what God says. That's the problem because you're not listening, because you haven't obeyed. That's why there's a controversy. Your sin has separated between you and your God, and he loves you enough to send an emissary, an intermediary. He, send, he loves you enough to send a mediator to tell you what he expects of you, old oh man. That's what he did in 2 Samuel 12. You know, David didn't listen to Nathan and say, you know what, well, if God will just come down here and tell me directly, then I'd be willing to repent. It doesn't work that way. And so God uses prophets to communicate with the human family. You remember when uh, Moses and his brother Aaron were dispatched by God to communicate with the Pharaoh in Egypt? Why didn't God just appear to Pharaoh directly and tell him, I have a problem with the way you're abusing my people. I want you to let my people go. God doesn't typically do it that way. He dispatches mediators. He dispatched Moses and Aaron, told them to tell Pharaoh what he expected Pharaoh to do. And when Pharaoh didn't listen to Aaron and Moses, you know what? He wasn't listening to God. God uses mediators. He uses prophets. Prophets didn't only take messages in one direction, that is, from God to the people. Sometimes the prophets were responsible for speaking to God on the people's behalf. You remember when Moses has Israel out there in the wilderness and, and he's begging with them, listen, don't sin, don't do this, listen to God, obey his law, follow what he says, and everything will be good with you. And sometimes they would not follow, they would not obey. And God was going to visit the consequences of their sin on them. You remember on one occasion, Moses begs God. He pleads with God not to destroy the people. The people didn't ask Moses to do that. But Moses is standing between God and the people, begging God to spare these people. He's being a mediator. He's being an intermediary. Look at Jeremiah chapter 27. There's lots of examples of this kind of thing. I just try to pick something that I think is fairly straightforward and obvious. Look at Jeremiah chapter 27. In Jeremiah 27, I'll begin here at verse number 16. 
Then I spoke to the priests and to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, do not listen to the words of your prophets who are prophesying to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a desolation? What's he saying? There are people saying all kinds of things. But in verse 18, if they are prophets and if the word of the Lord is with them, then let them intercede with the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, that the vessels that are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and in Jerusalem may not go to Babylon. What's he saying? You know, these men are pretending to bring messages from God to the people, and sometimes that's, the, that's what most people would expect. You're going to bring a message from God to us, but he says, if the person is a true prophet, then they should be able to intervene with God on behalf of the people. It's not a one-way communication. When someone stands between two parties with a live controversy, the one who stands between has to be able to communicate with both parties who are having trouble communicating with one another. Does that make sense to you? Because if the person who stands in the middle cannot communicate effectively with both parties, the controversy will never be resolved. And so a prophet had to be able to speak to the people on God's behalf, but also had to be able to speak to God on the people's behalf. Prophets. God also used priests in your Old Testament. Now you'll notice Israel had a system of priests and the priests were responsible for teaching the people the commandments that God had given to them. You'll see this in Deuteronomy 24 and 8. You see it in 2 Kings also 17 and verse 27 and other places. The priests were responsible for teaching the people what God called them to do, how God called them to live. They were also responsible for communicating to God on the people's behalf. You know, when you read in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, all that system of sacrifices and the meal offerings and the grain offerings and the different kinds of animal offerings and so forth, what's that all about? Well, I want you to notice what goes on there. The people who wanted to make sacrifices brought their sacrifices to the priests and the priests were the ones who made the offerings to God on their behalf. God placed the priests in between himself and the people. They were mediators. They facilitated communication from God to the people. This is what God expects you to do, how he expects you to live. They facilitated communication from the people to God. These are the offerings that people are bringing to God to address their sin, to show their thanksgiving, and so forth. He used prophets, and he used priests. He also used kings in your Old Testament. You remember, Israel's kings were supposed to restrain evil. They were supposed to punish those who violated the laws of God. Even pagan rulers were expected to do this. The king was a representative of God before the people. He was a human mediator between God and his people. It also worked the other way, though. The king was required to study God's word himself, to lead reforms and restorations in Israel and in Judah, to bring the people back to God, to help the people in their relationship with God as they were helping facilitate relationship between God and the people. Now, what am I saying about all of this? What I'm saying to you is you know in your own life that there are just certain times and certain relationships where you need some help. And when you need help, you oftentimes need a mediator, someone who can stand between two parties that for whatever reason are having some difficulty communicating with one another. Sometimes the difficulty is distance. Sometimes the difficulty is language. We don't have the same words to use in common to share our ideas back and forth. And sometimes the problem is that there is a live controversy. Someone has done something wrong. And I say to you, that's that same system, that same framework, God recognizes that in his dealings with the human family. And he used a series of people and offices to facilitate communication with the human family. 
He used prophets, and most people are very aware of prophets, and they're prominent in our minds, but he used priests the same way, and he used kings the same way as well. Under the, uh, the old covenant, the old dispensation, God had this series of offices and innumerable people to help him maintain good communication with the human family to try to repair the breaches that were made by sin under the old covenant. In the new covenant, in the new covenant, all of those offices and all of those people coalesce in one being, the man Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'll begin at verse number 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings, he says, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen to it. He desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants from his perspective. There's a breach between him and the human family. What does he want? He wants that relationship repaired. He wants the breaches remedied. And how is he going to do it? Verse number five. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Now, what's his point? I sometimes talk with folks who want to uh, discourse with me about the Old Testament, and I like the Old Testament. I've got no problem talking about the Old Testament, but you know what? When you look at that Old Testament, you need to look at it from the proper perspective. It's a retrospection when we look at the Old Testament. We look back at the Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament. And I'll tell you what, this one verse tells me that. Because when I look at my Old Testament, the system that God had set up, he had all of these people and all of these offices to facilitate relationship with the human family. And then Paul is announcing right here that today there is exactly one mediator between God and men, the man, he says, Christ Jesus. And how does he facilitate? How does he fix the problem? How does he address the sin? How does he deal with the offense? He gave his life to fix the problem. There's only one person who's ever done that. There's only one person who could ever do that. You know, I know that Moses once offered to give his life and God didn't take it. It wouldn't have done any good. Jesus, the Bible says, is the mediator of a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 6, chapter 9 also in verse number 15, chapter 12 and verse number 24. Jesus is the mediator of a new and a better covenant, a new and a better arrangement. He is our prophet. Jesus is the one who speaks to God on our behalf and speaks to us on his behalf. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, you'll remember this, Moses told us that this was going to come. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, he told us that this is what God had in mind. Listen, God always had this in mind. Under that old covenant, he was simply doing something that was needing to be done in an intermediate sense, but he was always making his way to Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 18, listen to this, beginning at verse number 17. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken, verse number 18, I will raise up for them, for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my 
my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. I will raise up a prophet. I will choose the mediator. I will choose the person that I can communicate with whom I will also listen to, and I will tell him what to say, and he will say that to you on my behalf. And that's why it says in verse 19, whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Listen, when God tells the mediator, Christ Jesus, what he wants, and then Christ turns around and tells us what God wants, when we don't listen to Christ, we're not listening to God. When we rebel against Christ, then we're rebelling against God. There's only one, only one, only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, Verse 22, and the Bible tells us Jesus Christ is that prophet that was promised there in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, the very beginning of the book, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. He used the prophets as intermediaries to communicate with the human family. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. What's he saying? God used to use a system of prophets, all kinds of people speaking to select subsections of the human family here and there, giving them discreet messages and so forth. He says, but in these last days, under the new arrangement, under the new and better covenant, he speaks to us by his son. There's only one. And so Jesus does the work that all those prophets used to do under the old arrangement. Jesus also does the work of the priest. He is our priest. Here in the book of Hebrews already, look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, the Bible says, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Look at chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14, since then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Jesus does the work that the whole system of prophets were called upon to do under the old covenant. Jesus does the work that the whole system of priesthood was designed to do under the old covenant. Now, if he's prophet and he's priest, well, the only thing we might be missing then is king. But then I see in my Bible that Jesus does the work of the king also. The Bible tells me that he is our king. Look at Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew chapter 27, of course, you can see this in various places. Um, you remember when he's there before Pilate, Pilate's going to ask him directly about him being a king, having a kingdom. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. Now I know that's not the way we typically would express an affirmation today, but I, I like to sometimes bring this thing down to the 21st century. You said it, brother. Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You said it. Jesus is the prophet, he's the priest, and he's the king. Now, under the old covenant, we needed all of these people, all of these offices, but I'm saying to you, in the new covenant, this better arrangement, we don't need all of those different people. We don't need all of those different offices. They all coalesce in one being, Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, you'll recall this as well. The Bible says that Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. He is the king of kings. So we had all of these different people, all of these different offices designed by God to help us mend our relationship with him. The prophet speaking to us and speaking to God on our behalf. 
the priest speaking to us, teaching us, and then us bringing sacrifices and offerings to repair the breaches that have happened because of our sin, express our thanksgiving. We have the king whose job it is to know what God wants done and to tell us, to teach us, to restrain us from doing evil and then to lead restoration on our behalf to try to bring us back into compliance with the will of God. All of those people, all of those offices, and all we ever needed was one, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in uh, Isaiah 53, in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Listen to this. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for the transgressor. Everybody knows Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus. He's the one making intercession for the transgressors. This is what God promised him long ago. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 34, you remember there in chapter 8, Paul is talking about all the various things that could be some kind of impediment to our relationship with God. And uh, it's interesting for the sake of time, we won't go through all those various things. But, but when you get down here to verse number 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will, we not also with, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Listen to it. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Listen to it. Who indeed is interceding for us. There's only one person standing there at the right hand of God who God is going to listen to. When Jesus speaks to God on our behalf and he says, listen, I know he fell short. I know she went too far, but I died for him. I died for her. Her sins must be forgiven because my blood was spilled on Calvary's cross. God is going to listen to Jesus and Jesus alone. Paul says there is one who died. There is one making intercession with God for us. I tell you something, we couldn't make it without Jesus. I know folks, sincere folks, I, I have good friends who they go back into the Old Testament and they try to mine the Old Testament for everything that it's worth. And I'll tell you something, I have learned some things from folks who approach the Old Testament like that. I just say to you, when you look at the Old Testament, you have to look at it in retrospect, what used to be. Because I just don't live under a system where I need all these prophets and priests and and I don't need all these various human kings to help me to be right with God. All I need is to fix my eyes on Christ because there's only one mediator between God and man. In Hebrews 7, in verse 25, Paul says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. How do they draw near to God? How can a person today draw near to God? Only through him. Why? Because he always lives to make intercession for us. He always lives to mediate between us and God. In Romans 5 and 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him. In Romans 5, beginning at verse 10, he says, For if while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we were reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to it. Through whom we now have the reconciliation. We've received reconciliation how? Through Christ. How can the relationship between a human being and the God of heaven be restored? How can the breach be repaired? Only through Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
beginning at verse 18, God says, or Paul says, that God was through Christ reconciling the world to himself. Through Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself. There's actually a lot more that I can say, but really this is the point. Would you like to have a good and right relationship with the God of heaven? Would you like to address the problems that have been created between you and the God of heaven because of your sin? God has selected a mediator. He selected someone who is acceptable to him, someone that he will listen to and communicate with so that he can restore the relationship with you. The only question then is, are you willing to accept Jesus as your mediator because that's the person God is willing to accept. As I said to you before, you can't have an effective mediator unless both parties are going to listen. God says, I will listen. Are you going to listen? Now you can try this another way. Yes, you can. You can run out here under any religious system you want to. You can try this a different way. Can I just tell you that all religions are not the same? I'm just telling you they're not all the same. You know why they're not all the same? Because all of them don't recognize that Jesus is the one person that God will listen to. He's the one person that you need to listen to. Now you can go out here and listen to anybody you want to, but God's only gonna listen to Jesus. Now if you wanna have a relationship with him, you better start listening to Christ. Would you like to repair the breaches in your relationship with God? If you would, then you have to come through Christ. That's the only way. In the book of Job, it's interesting to me, one of the remarkable things that Job says in Job chapter nine, beginning at verse number 32, he says, for he is not a man, he's talking about God. Now you remember Job has had all these bad things happen in his life and he's sort of wondering how all this has come to pass and he's thinking that God is the one who has sort of either visited this upon him or he's allowed these things to happen. He doesn't know all the backdrop. He doesn't know that Satan is active in doing these things to him. And so he wants to talk with God. He knows there's a problem, but he just doesn't know how to fix it. And he's explaining that, that there's this difficulty that he can't fix it. And he says in verse 32, he is not a man as I am that I might answer him that we should come to trial together. He says, listen, I can't just sit down with God and talk to him one on one and fix all of this. So how is he going to do it? He says in verse 33, there is no arbiter. And that's where I know the King James, the old version says no daysman. And I believe the American Standard 1901 says no umpire. There's no mediator. There's this problem between me and God and I don't know how to fix it. You know what I need? I need some help. And he says, someone who might lay his hand on us both. Someone who could, as it were, put one hand on God's shoulder and put one hand on my shoulder and talk to us both and, and reconcile the problem so that we can come together. He says, I don't have anyone like that. That's a terrible, that's a terrible position to be in to know that somehow or another you're on the outs with God and, and you know that you can't fix it yourself and you look around and you say, I just don't have anybody to help me with that. That's a terrible position to be in. But uh, you and I are not in that position. We do have a daysman. We, we do have an umpire. We do have a mediator. We do have somebody who can fix it. God says, I'll listen to Christ. I'd like to fix it. I would like to fix it, and, and I'm willing to listen to Christ. Would you like to fix it? Are you willing to listen to Christ? See, he's got one hand on God's shoulder, and then he's reaching out, trying to put his other hand on your shoulder. Where are you? Are you willing to let him fix it? Friends, I can't be more plain than this. If you won't let him fix it, it can't be fixed. Whatever the problem is in your life, Jesus can fix it, but if you won't let him fix it, it can't be fixed. 
God will listen to Jesus because Jesus is the son of God. He'll listen to him because he's the son of man. He'll listen to him because Jesus is deity. He understands perfectly, perfectly where the father is coming from because he's divine himself. We should be willing to listen to Jesus because he understands perfectly where we're coming from because he also condescended to become a human being. He understands both sides. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Are you willing to do whatever he says? If he tells you to go left, are you willing to go left? If he says go right, are you willing to go right? Are you willing to change? Will you do it his way? Because that's what repentance is. You've been doing it your way your whole life. I tell people all the time, you've been doing it your way your whole life. It's time to do it God's way. That's what repentance is. You're gonna do it God's way from now on. If you believe in Jesus, you'll have to say that. I believe Jesus is the son of God. The Bible says that confession moves you closer to being saved. That's what Jesus says about it. That confession moves you closer to being saved and then you're baptized to have your sins washed away. You have to be baptized to have your sins washed away. Not because we say you have to be baptized, but because the mediator says you have to be baptized to have your sins washed away. He's the one who can fix it and he says, this is how I'm going to fix it. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. If you won't do it Jesus' way, it can't be done. He says, this is the way. Believe in me, be baptized, I'll wash your sins away, and then you can be numbered among the children of God. The relationship can be repaired. If you haven't been baptized to have your sins washed away, we would love to help you with that this morning. We're going to stand and sing this song, and I want you to know that as we do that, this song is for you. If you're sitting here and you know your relationship with God is not what it needs to be, and you would like to come to Jesus to allow him to fix it, please come. We would love to help you with that. And as we stand and sing this song of invitation, this is the time to come. And if you've already been baptized and you know you've strayed away, you have not been living a faithful life, you have fallen out of duty with God in some way, please come. We would love to help you with that. Will you come? As we stand and sing this song as invitation, would you come? Bring Christ your